So, good afternoon, I think it is now. Um, yes, I've been asked to speak about HPV primary prevention in practice. I'm from an infectious disease epidemiology, epidemiologist from Tampa University. So, first of all, a short introduction about HPV vaccination. You've already heard quite a lot already. However, human papillomavirus, or HPV, is known to be the most common sexually transmitted virus. From serology studies, we can see that there's approximately 80% lifetime risk of acquiring this virus. And currently, although Vitaly this morning was saying that there was over 200 types of HPV, only 12 of these types are classified as high-risk oncogenic types, plus also one probably high-risk type. So here, oh, yes, here we can see these 12 types arranged in decreasing occurrence in invasive cervical cancer cases. And this is an important point, because not all HPV types of these oncogenic types are equal. They're not all as oncogenic as each other. There are currently three licensed prophylactic vaccines, the first two generations being the bivalent and quadrivalent. They are targeting the two most high-risk types of here, 16 and 18, also the most occurrence most prevalent in invasive cervical cancer cases. However, of very good for the vaccine, it is also shown that there is a, a amount of cross-protection against types which are phylogenetically related to those 16 and 18. So for the bivalent, for example, we can see cross-protection against HP45, 33 here in green, 31, 52, and also 35. So in this very short 15 minutes, I'm only going to talk very briefly about these five dimensions, which are critical for a successful implementation of HPV vaccination. First of all, I'm going to talk about long-term immunogenicity, then long-term efficacy of the vaccine, different vaccination strategies, and then synergistic implementation. So what this means is the, the synergy of primary plus secondary prevention. And then also, critically, I'm going to talk about the equitable delivery of a vaccination program. So in Finland, we have quite a nice situation because we've had several Finnish HPV vaccine trials. And also in Finland, it, every single resident, including also migrants, has a unique personal identification number code. And this enables us to follow up the vaccinated cohorts in the health registries at later points in time. So for example, here in Finland, we have, oops, I'll go back again, here in, Finland, we have this whole population registries here, which represent the entire population. And then we can also link to some population-based cohorts. And these are, for example, the Finnish Maternity Biobank, which has approximately 96% of serum samples from all pregnant women in Finland since 1983. And again, we can link this to the, the vaccinated individuals from these trials. So first of all, the trials I'm going to talk about in this long-term immunogenicity is the FUTURE2 and Patricia trials. So these are both phase three trials. One of the things which we first of all found was that there is a difference according to the age at which you vaccinate the individuals. So here, this lighter gray bar represents individuals who are vaccinated at age 12 to 14, and the darker gray are young adults, so those vaccinated over 15. And there is a significant difference in the geometric mean titer of antibody, this is the antibody level produced after vaccination, depending on the age at which you vaccinate. Second of all, it has been of interest to see if there is an amnestic response to vaccination. Now, after vaccinating in the long term, we cannot expose the person to the virus as an antigen challenge because obviously this is unethical. So what has been done is after the Gardasil follow-up, after five years, they have been given another dose of Gardasil. And if you see here, the, the antibody level plateaus after the third dose until five years. And at this point here, where you see this red arrow, 
you can see this very critical amnestic um, response which we want to see goes right up much more than the level of natural infection. So here on this diagram, the, the line that is not dotted, the top line, is the one induced from vaccination. The one below is the one from natural infection. The next thing that's been very interesting to look at, so the future two trial, this is looking at the Gardasil vaccine, whereas the Patricia trial is looking at the bivalent vaccine. So this has enabled us to do a head-to-head -co -head comparison of the antibody levels over time in these vaccinated cohorts. So what we have done is we've linked these individuals from these trials to the Finnish maternity biobank, from which we have a series of samples from the same women who have had consecutive pregnancies. And here we have a rather interesting finding. So we can see after 12 years for HPV 16 and 18, there is a durable response. The, the antibody levels here um, recorded in international units are still above the level that we expect from natural infection. However, the antibody titer produced from cervix, this is the bivalent vaccine, is significantly higher than that from Gardasil. So moving on now to the long-term efficacy. Already Mark Arben has talked a bit about this. However, the, the thing we'd really like to point out here, so in this diagram, this is for the bivalent vaccine against cervix, the first two CIN3 plus are talking about ones which are associated with 16 and 18, HPV 16 and 18, whereas the ones in the two lower rows are for irrespective of HPV type. And you can see, comparably, after four years and up to 10 years, the vaccine efficacy is durable, it's almost the same. Now, this possibility that we have in Finland to link with the long term, with the health registries has also enabled us to finally show, as you can see, that vaccination protects against invasive HPV associated cancers. So what we have done is we have looked at these vaccinated cohorts and compared them to age-lined non-HPV vaccinated women. These are unvaccinated women. And you can see over here in the vaccinated women, there are no cases of HPV associated invasive cervical or invasive cancers. Whereas in the age-aligned cohort, we see 10 cases with a rate of eight. So moving on to the vaccination strategy. So in many countries such as Scotland or Rwanda or Bhutan, it's possible to get a vaccination coverage above 90%. And with this, you can achieve high levels of hair defect. This means protection against um, HPV 16 and 18 in those who are unvaccinated in the same cohort. But in many countries, this is not so possible. We're currently in a climate where there are vaccine hesitancy and quite often it's not possible to get uh, the vaccination coverage above 90%. So in Finland in 2007, we initiated a trial to compare different vaccination strategies with moderate level of courage, uh, coverage, sorry, vaccine coverage, to see how we can optimize this strategy in light of this moderate coverage. So what we first of all did is we took 33 communities all over Finland we have randomized these communities to three arms. So the first two arms are intervention arms. In arm A, we apply gender neutral vaccination. This is HPV vaccination of girls and boys. In arm B, it is girls only vaccination. This is HPV vaccination only of the girls. And in C arm, we have a control arm where we are vaccinating with a control vaccine here, which is the hepatitis B vaccine. These individuals are then vaccinated at the ages of 12 to, to 15, and then followed up at the age of 18, and then again also at the age of 22. So in this trial, we have vaccinated four birth cohorts, those born in 1992 until 1995. And with heart defect, what we expect to see from the mathematical models is with the younger birth cohorts, the heart defect should start to manifest. So we should not possibly see it at this level of coverage in the, the, the oldest birth cohort, those born in 1992, but we should start to see it perhaps in 1994 born or 1995 born. 
And this is what we do see, but it depends on the vaccination strategy. So here what we're looking at is non-HPV vaccinated women. As this is community randomized, we are comparing the unvaccinated women in arm A to arm C, and the unvaccinated women in arms B to arm C. And as you can see, for HPV 18, we start to see on this, the third red line, so here we're looking at gender neutral, and it goes from 1992 to 1995, the third red line it starts to decrease. This is 1994 to 1995 birth cohorts. And this is what we are seeing as evidence of HPV 18 heart effect. However, similarly, we're also seeing this for these cross-protected types of 31, 33, and 35. And this is quite a, a, a significant trend until the, the younger birth cohorts, which we're seeing. However, for the gender neutral, the gen girls only arm, we don't see such the clear effect. We found some heart effect against HPV 18, but none against 31, 35, and 33. And also notably, you'll see there is no HPV-16 on this board. The reason is because we did not see any heart effect against HPV-16. We did not see it when using DNA as the, the, the marker of current infection. And this is just to also show this again visually. So it's 33 communities, they're spatially distributed. This is the arm A's communities, and we can see from this map on the left, where we have the, the oldest birth cohort until the youngest birth cohort, we can see the prevalence going from this red color to blue. That means it's decreasing of HPV 18, 31, 33, and 35. So another point, in our countries where we have HPV vaccinated, vaccination implemented, we have these cohorts of vaccinated women marching towards the screening. And what should we do at this screening point? So in Finland, we have used these trials. We have taken these HPV vaccinated women and we have then randomized them again to implement a trial of different screening strategies. So we're currently in the middle of implementing it. So I'm going to just present the baseline findings that we have at the moment. However, First of all, I'll just kind of explain a little bit. So in the trials, we have people who are vaccinated at 12 to 15. These are vaccinated to two arms, the frequent screening arm and the infrequent screening arm. However, in the trials, it was also unethical not to vaccinate the unvaccinated participants. So when they reached the age of 18, we cross-vaccinated them. We again offered them HPV vaccination. But at the age of 18, we expect that some of them have already had their sexual debut and HPV has been circulating in the cohort already. So they have been placed in the safety arm. We are, we are looking at infrequent screening. So what I mean by frequent and infrequent screening is frequent is screening at the age of 22, 25 and 28. Infrequent is screening in the age of 28 and in the safety arm at 25. So, so far what we're seeing is we don't see a significant difference in the cases of HISL and CIN for this frequent versus safety arm. So we're quite happy that it's safe to continue with this trial. And then also in these different follow-ups, we've been taking HPV, uh, we've been testing for HPV. And the point that is particularly nice, I'd like to show you here. So these are individuals vaccinated at the age of 12 to 13, 12 to 15. And in blue, you can see HPV 16 and 18 is extremely rare. So the number represents, before the brackets, represents the actual number who were positive. And then in brackets, we have the percentage. So only 0.5% to 0.3% positive for 16 in these vaccinated individuals. Now, finally, I would also like to talk about cost effectiveness. So just to familiarize you quickly with this graph, on the y-axis, we have costs in euro, and on the x-axis, we have quality of life years lost. The green dots are no vaccination, the red dots girls only, and the blue are girls and boys vaccination. And each dot represents a different screening practice combined with vaccination practice. This is the current practice in Finland. It is actually the most expensive practice and not necessarily the most effective. The second point I'd like to make 
or is the fact that when we change from no vaccination to girls and boys vaccination, but keep the, the same screening strategies, not only do we have less quality of life years lost, but it's actually more, it actually saves money. It's less costly. Oops. And the third point I'd like to make, so now we're comparing these red dots, the girls only, to the girls and boys vaccination. It does not necessarily increase the cost much, but it does increase or it causes less quality of life years to be lost. And the last point I'd like to make is that of equitable delivery of vaccination. So it is paramount of importance that you have equitable delivery of vaccination. This is something which can be explained by the Swiss cheese model of, of preventative strategy. So if you think of a block of cheese as your preventative package against cervical cancer, and we think of Swiss cheese, that block of cheese includes vaccination and also cervical screening. We then take the slices of cheese. First slice might be vaccination. Second slice might be first invitation to screening. Second, the second invitation to screening. The whole, the person who escapes the first vaccination will likely be correlated with the place of the whole in the next slice of cheese. What this means is the person who escapes the first preventative barrier might be also at more risk of, preventing, of escaping the second preventative barrier. And this is something that is extremely important to make sure in, the vac in our national vaccination programs that it does not occur. It has been shown that one of the best ways to prevent this from happening is to have school-based vaccination. So very finally, I'm just going to summarize. There is a difference in the vaccine-induced antibody level over time between the bivalent and the quadrivalent vaccine. However, the biological impact of this is as yet unknown. The two first-generation vaccines display long-term efficacy up to 12 years. And gender-neutral vaccination confers better herd effect against HPV 18, 31, 33, and 35, even in moderate level of coverage. Also, the integration of vaccination and screening programs will be key in the future as we have these HPV vaccinated cohorts reaching the age for screening. And finally, the equitable delivery of HPV vaccination is crucial, which can be optimized via a school-based approach. I would just like to also acknowledge these people, especially Professor Matti Lettinen, who is the principal investigator of many of these studies. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. One short question. You could accept. Yes, Roland. Yes. Why not 16? HPV 16 has a much higher basic reproduction number. So HPVs as, an, as a whole, their reproduction number is very low. And the lower the basic reproduction number of a HPV type, the easier it is to confer herd effect. The higher the basic reproduction number, the higher vaccination coverage you need to confer herd effect. Now, in terms of different HPVs, they actually have different um, basic reproduction numbers. HPV 16 is particularly special in that it's R0, or basic reproduction number, is higher. And this means that it requires a higher level of coverage to get herd effect. Thank you very much. Oh. No, I don't think it's very clear. Can you say oh. what it is? The basic oh, very sorry. So um, this is a, in a measure in infectious disease epidemiology used for different types of infections or pathogens. It talks about the transmissibility. So if you think on whole of one HPV infected individual, how many individuals in a completely susceptible population will it infect? So if in a completely susceptible population you have one individual who's HPV 16 positive and it only infects one on average, then we can expect that this disease will not survive, it will um, fade out. But the higher this number is, the higher the the higher the transmissibility is, it also is, means the harder it is to get heart effect also. Thank you very much. So we welcome the third, thank you.